following is a video presentation of the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. We have seen this, these statistics before, but it's, it never ceases to kind of shock me in terms of if when we're looking at water and understanding what in terms of um, we think about the water that we can use, it's really just a tiny fraction of the world's water. So, so as a result, though, of the, particularly those scarcity graphics, we hear this frame of water wars are coming. Countries are going to fight over, wa uh, over water based on these scarcities. And we see it in our newspapers every time. This is a favorite reframe of newspaper headline writers. And then also our politicians, notably often Egyptian politicians, uh, because the Nile River in Egypt, of course, sits downstream of, of, uh, of the Nile. And there's great concern and understandable concern given the dependency of Egypt on the rivers of, or the waters of the Nile. Uh, but there's a common refrain from uh, senior politicians. You can see it kind of even continuing today uh, that Really, the kind of whether water is going to be the next source of war in the Middle East is the common reframe and such. But it's really framed as we have them now, and they certainly are coming. Just look at the scarcity figures. I would suggest that there's a lot of logic, even not just those per capita figures, but we have 263 rivers that are shared by two or more countries. So our water systems are highly interdependent around in, uh, between countries. This is a is a a map of the Nile Basin, and in many ways the Nile is the poster child for this argument based on the fact that particularly Ethiopian highlands are, are the source of so much of the water, terribly poor country, lots of potential for hydro uh, power and development, and the Egyptians essentially putting, uh, historically, putting the kibosh on that because they're the stronger military power. The Nile Basin Initiative uh, is an effort that's been formalized since 1999, was going on before, but under World Bank and UN Development Program facilitation, you had all 10 countries coming together, very senior levels, continuing to, in the Nile Basin, and talking about developing a shared vision, which they've done, uh, and transitioning from a rights to water to a needs to water to sharing benefits. So it's taking, in some ways, starting by taking the political borders off the map, figuring out the irrigation needs, the energy needs, the ecosystem needs, the household needs, and trying to figure out the optimal utilization of water within a development frame um, to try to address the poverty across the basin and to be able to trade some of those benefits across borders when it makes sense. All of this is framed in a development context. None of this is framed necessarily in a conflict prevention context, but I would make the case in part because of that water wars frame and the high politics of water in the region, that's exactly what it is, even though it's frankly tactically useful not to frame it in those contexts, but put it in the development context. This is work that many of you will be familiar with, Aaron Wolf and colleagues, a geographer at Oregon State University, uh, to my mind, the kind of go-to person on uh, analyzing conflict and cooperation between countries over water. <clears throat> and Aaron and his colleagues took uh, over 1,800 examples of interactions between states and coded them from most conflictual, down at the bottom with formal war, to most cooperative, the formally signing an international water treaty. And I think what's interesting, we see a big red line there around verbal hostility. The politicians are really willing to rattle the sabers, but it in fact doesn't um, and only rarely results in formal, intentional use of force between countries over the issue of water. In the military acts, I think 27 of those 37 are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And so one case over-represents the ones where we see the most conflict. What we do see is a lot of cooperation, a lot of it, again, verbal, where there's a fairly low threshold. Um, but we do see uh, a trend, a trend that may be slowing down, but a trend in the last 20 to 30 years of increased cooperation around basins in part because of the interdependencies around water. That said, uh, I don't want to paint such a rosy picture as to suggest there's not a lot of conflict around water. I think for the most part, we've just been looking at the wrong levels between states. There's an awful lot of conflict below states and more local levels. So one that we're most familiar with certainly have plenty of examples in this country, some of which are incidentally violent, not necessarily organized violent, but um, so between sectors, so this is kind of agriculture versus urban use, and certainly if you're from the Southwest or from California, you have lots of stories to tell about this. 
Um, something that's in the news now, again, not to suggest, as some, I think, have wrongly suggested, that, well, Darfur is a climate change problem or Darfur is a water conflict. Well, there are all sorts of things that go into a crisis and a, and a, and a tragedy such as, as Darfur. And, but I would say that in some of these issues, we can't understand the full picture, especially if we're going to try to fundamentally address it, unless we understand some of the underlying issues, one of which are the, the, some of the demographics that Peter talked about, but also, in this case, the notion that there have been fundamental changes in, from the water connection in terms of rainfall, so dropped 30% over the last 50 years in this region. So long and sustained droughts. Um, the predictions in terms of climate change really largely based on, on declining uh, availability of water, really meaning that foodstuff production in these areas are going to be bad. Uh, and then also just a loss of arable land because of the process of desertification. So one can ultimately then really exacerbating what we've had historically in terms of the fights between the pastoralists and the agriculturalists. Two different ways of making a living, uh, but really then exacerbating and coming to a head, especially when someone's willing to exploit it for their own purposes, as the, as the government in Khartoum is, is um, so willing to do. This is a picture from Cochabamba, Bolivia, where again, only one person died at the end of the gun, which of course for that one person is, is terrifically tragic. But it was a protest that uh, are largely around the privatization of the water and the delivery of services in the city of Cochabamba that led to widespread protests that then became protests about a lot of things, including the water, that brought down two successive governments uh, in, in Bolivia. So high politics, even though it's not necessarily classic security in the definition of engagement of, of organized violence. Dams, of course. This is um, Three Gorges, which is in China we hear so much about. But in, I believe it was the 2000 World Commission on Dams report looked at large dams in the, oh, I think it was since 1935, that estimated 40 to 80 million people, well, that's a big gap, but 40 to 80 million people were displaced by large dam infrastructure. So again, not people necessarily, um, uh, not kind of conflict in the classic sense, but particularly when one factors in some fairly high levels of corruption and the inability for relocation, tremendously disruptive in terms of people's lives and welfare. And so, again, if we, back to if we only frame the water crisis in this kind of water wars, we, A, are not tied to the evidence, and B, are missing a lot of what is important around conflict management around water. Um, and so to end on a more positive note, um, and I think we see some examples playing water playing very different roles, sometimes in active conflicts. Uh, so you had literally Jordan, uh, um, Jordanians and Israelis meeting throughout their period of, of conflict to manage water, uh, called picnic table talks in part because they met at a picnic table in the border area. Good water makes good neighbors is also uh, an example drawn from this region where very local, I mean, school to school and town to town relationships developed between Israelis and Palestinians, Jordanians and Israelis, largely around the interdependence on sanitation. So the lack of treatment of sanitation on the Palestinian side, having negative health implications on the Israeli side, bringing those parties together that allow them, based on that interdependence, to go together and lobby at national levels and international levels, testify here up in the hill in terms of, in terms of influencing the foreign, um, foreign assistance debates in this country. Nile Basin Initiative, I mentioned as, as uh, early on as one kind of example in this realm. The other, in terms of, okay, well, yeah, that's great, lifeline, but it's not really to the core of the issue. Water's still going to be a peripheral issue. To that, I would say, listen, it, consistent with the notion that water is not what countries initially start fighting about. I would say that can be true, and at the same time, water can be absolutely critical to ending the conflict. So whether it's India, Pakistan, Palestine, Israel, it's not what's instigated the conflict, but you better believe you have to go through water to get out of the conflict. So both of, in both of those situations, you have water as the focus of the negotiations to come out of it. So it doesn't get you into the problem, but you gotta go through it to get out of the, to get out of the conflict, any sort of sustainable peace. 